This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Burgamy. Yes, indeed, you heard them. Coming to you every week since 1966, a little bit before my time. <laughs> It is the Georgia Farm Monitor. So glad you tuned in. I'm one half of your host, Ray Delessio. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. Well, if you have anything to do with the Georgia poultry industry, this is one show you do not want to miss. Coming up, hear what preparations that state officials are making in the event of an avian flu outbreak here in Georgia and what precautions poultry producers should be taking to help avoid a possible outbreak. It's information you need to know. Also on the show, how much effect, if any, did the abnormal spring weather have on this year's Vidalia onion crop? Damon Jones investigates. And then later, Ranger Nick goes international this month as UGA professor Dr. Nick Furman teaches us about the similarities between U.S. and Scottish agriculture. All this and more starting right now on the Georgia Farm Monitor. When you think of Toombs County, the first crop that comes to mind is, of course, the sweet Vidalia onion. However, with Mother Nature failing to cooperate during the growing season, this year's numbers are a little bit down. How much so? Damon Jones has that answer. It's officially summertime, and that means that people around the state will be huddled around the grill. And nothing goes better with that hamburger than one of Georgia's signature crop, the Vidalia onion. However, it will be in shorter supply this year due to poor weather at times during the growing season. But the numbers aren't down as much as initially feared. We target about 5 million units uh, a, a year to, to market, and uh, that fluctuates. Some years we're a little over 5 million, some years we're a little off. Uh, this year from our projections, we've already sold about 3.2 million and got a little over a million left. So we'll be about 4.3 or 4.4. Uh, and that's about what we, uh, we kind of are used to. The main reason for the higher than expected numbers is the fact that most of the heavy damage was very localized. And while that was good news for most of the producers, some weren't so lucky. The, the sad thing is that some growers were hit, you know, really impacted negatively. And uh, some of those fields just weren't brought in. They had some hail storms and some heavy winds and rains right when it's time to harvest. And so you, you were kind of either on one end of the spectrum or the other, you had a real good crop or had some, some problems that really hurt them. And we also had a lot of heavy winds. We had uh, four or five instances with some 40 mile an hour or more winds, and that just lays the, the foliage over and lays the things over like it would a tree, and they just don't stand up like they should, and, and we'll get a little bit smaller onion, even if we can get anything out of those fields. One of the places that did fare pretty well this season was Herndon Farms, who despite running into a few problems along the way, was able to produce another quality yield. Our crop here at Herndon Farms, we had a, we had an exceptional crop. The quality was great and, uh, you know, had, a, had, a, had some sizing issues as far as the, the development of the crop, but as far as quality and, and availability, we had a, an, an exceptional crop. However, it didn't come without plenty of hard work as the inclement weather did force some minor changes along the way. As for advice on how to best deal with these obstacles, Herndon believes in treating each segment of the crop differently. You, you have a program that you go by, but every field is different. We treat our fields individual. We don't treat a crop of Valley onions as a, as a crop. We treat it farm by farm. But some people have a general idea of what it takes to grow an onion. and. It, and it kind of uh, dictates what they do year in and year out. But this, is, this was one of the years that was a little more tricky for, for folks in my area, and we really had to adjust everything we did field by field and uh, not treat it as a value crop as a whole. It was just that it was in, each individual farm had to be treated differently. And Georgia farmers weren't the only ones affected as onion numbers all over the country are down. And that means it will be another strong market for this commodity. Unfortunately for the Texas producers, they had a horrible crop and some other ha things happened in some other regions that, that was not expected. And so by the time ours actually got ready, we had, in had inherited a good market situation a lot better than what it was looking in early February. As for what those consumers can expect to see in the stores. Vitae's will be a little shorter this year than normal uh, as far as the quantities available, but the quality, the quality should be second to none. Reporting from Toombs County, I'm Damon Jones for the Georgia Farm Monitor. 
All right. Well, meantime, both state and ag officials here in Georgia have already begun preparations for what could potentially be a devastating outbreak of the avian flu, which to date has resulted in the U.S. turkey industry losing close to seven and a half percent of its average inventory. Now, I say potentially because experts cannot predict for sure whether or not the avian virus will even reach Georgia. Nonetheless, the Department of Agriculture is taking no chances. In fact, they recently held a briefing with members of the Georgia poultry industry in hopes of educating them on the dangers of this particular strain of virus. Commissioner Gary Black telling the Farm Monitor efforts to control, contain, or even avoid the virus altogether begins with you, the farmer. That personal responsibility is going to be the, you know, maybe the big leverage point here to limit the exposure. Because if farmers will, will practice better biosecurity measures and that makes you know, limiting access and even protecting their own self with foot, foot washes, those kind of things within their own operations, that's the, the best offense is always going to be a real good defense. People who raise backyard poultry, uh, this virus affects them too. And they, I would recommend that, that they uh, really become aware of things such as biosecurity and also be, be aware of what this virus looks like, what it can do, and who to contact. That's so important because the best uh, way we're going to be able to stop this thing is to catch it very quickly and to stop it. All right, a couple of facts you should know about AI. First off, the Georgia Department of Agriculture confirms it is an animal health issue, not a food safety or public health issue. In other words, this particular strand of virus cannot pass between humans and animals. Also, all commercially produced poultry is tested for avian flu prior to being processed, meaning poultry products and eggs are still safe for human consumption. And of course, the one advantage Georgia has right now are its hot summer temperatures. This virus cannot survive in hot environments. It prefers cool, moist, and dark environments. For everything and anything you need to know about the avian flu virus, log on to the address you see there. That is gfb.org slash avian flu. That'll direct you to the Georgia Department of Agriculture's page and numbers to contact in the event you suspect a case of avian flu. Well, all over Georgia, producers depend on irrigation to grow healthy, abundant crops. At UGA Stripling Irrigation Research Park in Camilla, studies are underway to help find better, more efficient ways for producers to irrigate their crops. The Monitor's Mark Wildman recently attended a field day at the research park, and he has this report. During the hot, dry Georgia summers, farmers depend on being able to supply their crops with the water they need. Over the years, irrigation like this center pivot have kept farms across Georgia in business. And UGA's Stripling Irrigation Research Park works on projects to help the industry get the most out of their irrigation. Well, the Stripling Park is all about helping our Georgia irrigators be as efficient as they can be when they irrigate. So we carry out lots of research and, and outreach and extension projects related to how we irrigate our crops, how more efficiently we can irrigate those crops using various techniques and technologies. Growers and others involved in agriculture attended a field day to highlight important work being done here. Our field day and technology conference is designed for the audience to see the scientists here in their plots, to see what's going on in terms of cotton, corn, peanut, soybean, uh, irrigated agriculture research. They're seeing how fungicides can be applied. They're seeing how different soil amendments react in our sandy soils. They're seeing how to better schedule irrigation for our crops so that you know, we make the best use of every drop that we do apply to the crops. UGA researcher Bob Kimmerate conducts several projects here in Camilla and believes this facility plays an important part in advancing Georgia agriculture. Where we're located in South Georgia, we have a significant problem with diseases like southern corn rust, the target spot on cotton, we have nematode problems. So working here, we're pretty much assured we're going to get great data that can be used to help the growers. The next thing is we have the technical expertise with the staff here as well as the facilities that we're trying to develop new and improved ways to use chemigation, to use irrigation to manage disease. Uh, this is, there's no better place to do that. And so we're able to do things at this, at this facility that we can't do anywhere else, and we're grateful for that. Those who attended got a chance to view many projects, and they also got an opportunity to hear from Georgia Farm Bureau President Zippy Duval about how important it is for farmers to network and speak up on important ag issues.
You know, my job is to build relationships. You know, you do nothing in life and accomplish anything on your own. And we have to have relationships with not only other organizations, but their volunteers and our volunteers working together uh, through relationships to make sure that all of agriculture here in the state of Georgia gets their voice heard. So as the years go by, the research done here will help farmers grow healthier crops more efficiently. And that will benefit us all. To have this research farm right here is just a wonderful opportunity for us to explore ways to conserve uh, water, to be able to use our, our sprays efficient, more efficiently, uh, n not just to make, I mean, yes, of course, it's a huge impact on the farmer and be able to make him uh, more economically competitive with his neighbors in the world, but it also gives us data to be able to carry to meetings that I go to and talk to the people that don't understand us, that do not have the opportunity to know the farmer. Well, I think this part plays a vital role, especially in today's climate of lawsuits and people pointing fingers at how much water each entity is using. So we play, a, I think, a vital role in helping show that farmers are being very efficient and helping them figure out ways to be even more efficient when they apply water. In Camilla, I'm Mark Wildman for the Georgia Farm Monitor. All right, still to come on the monitor, Ranger Nick files his monthly report from, of all places, Scotland. Hmm. The reason for his visit, coming up. But first, when the monitor continues, we spend time with the man who's held the title of Polk County Farm Bureau President for nearly 50 years. A conversation with James Casey when the Georgia Farm Monitor continues. Well, I was always real fascinated with plant science. I was always real interested, even at a young age. So uh, I guess I always kind of was inclined to go into agriculture. So I went to school originally for turf grass management. Now I wanted to go into agriculture, but I wanted to be a little bit more diverse in what I was doing. And once I got done with that, I was real satisfied with, you know, the classes I was taking, but uh, I wanted to go a little bit farther. So I went and got my master's degree in plant protection and pest management. I got real fascinated with plant pathology. Um, so that was something I really stayed interested in. Uh, as far as the industry went, I didn't necessarily want to go into industry. kind of wanted to be unbiased and help people on a scale that I didn't have to be necessarily opinionated in. So um, I felt like being a county agent, I could help people as well as to, uh, do things that I was interested in. You know, every day I come out here, I'm, I'm really excited about going to work. It's always a new problem, but uh, it's always something you have to investigate and kind of figure out what it is. So. You know, these guys might not necessarily know what's in their field or what's causing the issue, but you're the guy there to help, you know, determine that, give them recommendations. So I guess the being of service to, to people in need is probably the most favorite thing about it. Ultimately, there's so much information out there from various entities. People know that we're unbiased and we're basing all our answers based off of research that's been done with the university. So they know that what we're recommending or what we're talking about is, is true to the utmost point it can be. I love it. Um, the people here are great, you know, it's all laid back. Uh, it can be stressful at times, you know, but uh, for the most part we work with really good people who have, you know, really big hearts and just want to do the right thing and make a living. So helping those folks is, is definitely uh, something that I've, I feel very rewarded every day. By the end of 2015, James Casey will have served the ag community of Polk County for five decades, 50 years as their president. According to Casey, it's been a pleasure to help other farmers. As he recently told the Monitor, he takes the solace in the fact that a lot has been accomplished in 50 years. Visiting with James Casey and his wife in Cedartown gave us a chance to listen to many of their stories about the changes they've seen. Those changes were not only in the physical locations of the Polk County Farm Bureau office, but there are many advances and changes in farming technology since Casey first got involved with Georgia Farm Bureau in the 1950s. We have always had exceptionally good secretaries and insurance, uh, particularly managers, and uh, that's made it real easy on me. Uh, I don't deserve the credit for the success we've had. It's the people that have been involved in it. Uh, most of the time I had no idea what I was doing. Now another thing that we are uh, very proud of is about 35 years ago, uh, we started having a farm day for our school children. It thrills me that 20 years later, some of these uh, grown up will say, I remember coming to, to, to farm day. But as a result of the fact that we're now, we're doing better 
the state is compensating them better, and that's the reason we are able to put this building here uh, that we moved into in 1985. While Casey still oversees a lot of the functions with the local Farm Bureau operations, he's turned the majority of chores on his personal farm over to other family members. All of our children have been involved to some extent, but uh, our middle daughter uh, is our women's chairman here, and she has been District 3 uh, women's chairman for a while, so she's always been involved. And her main responsibility now at Farm Bureau is to get me to the conventions because I, I don't like to drive. And I, I've had cataract surgery and I can see a lot better now, but I feel a lot safer with her with her driving. So uh, she, she gets, that's one of the main things she does. Casey Farm Operations started in the 1880s in Polk County. He remembers his early days of farming too. Apparently I'm a, I'm a farmer by breeding, by birth, and by choice. Uh, my father was a farmer, his father was a farmer. Uh, my father, I honestly did not think I'd come back when I went to school. He didn't really think I'd ever come back, uh, but I never intended to do anything else, so I did. And although Mr. Casey said he has slowed down just a bit in the last few years, he still produces a large garden during the growing season. His wife told me she doesn't think he'll ever stop working. I think people, and they know that he's always, that he's always at Farm Bureau, and they just depend on him to look after things connected to agriculture. People, you know, they have respect for what he's done, I think. He is hard-headed. I think that may be one reason that he's done such a good job. <laughs> Up next, we jet set to the Scottish hills of the UK and learn about the agricultural wonders known as peat bogs. Ranger Nick, when the Georgia Farm Monitor continues, stay with us. I'm Ian Bennett and I'm from Lowndes County and I'm the state secretary. My family raises Charlotte cattle and Dorset sheep and that's really where I got my background started in the FFA and with agriculture. And I just kind of grew up helping my parents on our farm and then that's really when I got started in agriculture and in the FFA. I took an ag class in sixth grade because that was something I was interested in and I never really stopped from there. I started doing contests and doing some other stuff. And I, I ran for chapter office and ultimately ended up running for state office this past year. And the future for me is uh, definitely changing. Um, I definitely want to do something in agriculture, but I haven't really decided what. I'm definitely going to end up going back to my hometown and living and working on my family's farm. Um, but I definitely want to do something in agriculture, probably ag engineering. That's what I'm looking at right now, but I haven't exactly decided yet. To learn more about the National FFA Organization, log on to FFA.org. California's drought is making times tough for farmers there, but USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service is working with farmers to keep what little moisture there is in the soil. And with those principles of building uh, more uh, infiltration on the soil, that's going to help us prevent that water, the little water that we have from evaporating. Healthy soil holds water. One way to make sure soil stays healthy is through no-till practices which keeps in nutrients and shields soil from the elements. By leaving residue on top of the soil surface, I protect my soil. I protect it from winds and sun that can rob the moisture from the soil. If I give from, to my soil, my soil will give back to me. Durst says healthy soil practices allowed him to harvest a cereal crop last year when most of his neighbors did not. For the U.S. Department of Agriculture, I'm Bob Ellison. Well, finally today, this month, Ranger Nick is going international. Yeah, that's right. While traveling abroad for UGA, Dr. Furman grabbed his trusty old iPad and headed to the hills of Scotland for a lesson on something that is well over 10,000 years old. So we've been talking a lot about pond management on the Farm Monitor, and this month, Ranger Nick comes to you from the other side of the pond. I'm in Dunfree, Scotland, hanging out with Dr. Emily Taylor. We're talking about peat bogs. We're talking about managing land the same way we do in the United States with conservation easements. You're going to love this. We're digging into it right now. Dr. Taylor, tell us a little bit about your role in conserving these peat bogs. Okay, so I'm a Peatland Action Project Officer. Uh, we are here to help deliver the Scottish Government um, on a huge peatland restoration programme we have. We have £3 million this year to spend on peatland restoration. And why are we doing that? Well, for hundreds of years we've managed our peat bogs for other things other than habitat and the carbon store that they are. 
So we've drained them to make them better for grazing, we've drained them for forestry, and we've burnt them as well to improve the grazing. And now we're realising that's not the best practice. Mm. So we're busy trying to block up all those ditches, all those drains, raise the water table back up and get a functioning bog once again. It's interesting. So what we're saying is 40 some years ago, we we're telling people to drain these. Today, we're telling people to leave them alone. What's your role in helping bring about that action change with some of these farmers? Yeah, so it's a huge sea change in thinking. You know, we were incentivising drainage for, for many years, right up until the 70s. Um, and now we're saying, actually, we know that's not the best thing to do. So I'm there to go out, talk to the landowners, talk to the farmers, sit down over a cup of tea, talk about peatland restoration and what it means for them. It can be an integrated management with the rest of their management. Um, it can work in their favour as well. So it's just getting that message across. Face to face is always the best. That sounds so similar to what we do in the U.S. with Cooperative Extension. Y'all know I always put a plug in for our extension agents across the country. That kind of stuff is going on right here in Scotland. And I tell you, we're going to have to, maybe we'll cut this short. I'm kind of sinking over here, Emily, to be honest with you. We are standing in a peat bog. This is, this is wild. Exactly. You are doing a good job. <laughs> All right, Emily, so push this thing the rest of the way down. Let's see how many feet of peat we've got. Now, you're still going. Still going. All the way. Holy, we are out. You put in how many? Well, seven in there. Seven, each one of them about three feet? Yeah, yeah. 20 plus feet of peat. Incredible. How did this come to be? Well, this peat bog's probably around about 10,000 years old. These, this is called a lowland raised bog, and these formed from the little lakes that were left behind at the end of the last ice age. So these little lakes eventually became wetlands filled in with vegetation. Gradually that vegetation was compressed over time and actually started to grow as a dome. And this is when you get your peat formation. And the peat is formed from your sphagnum moss, which we're surrounded by here. Wow, and that stuff, for our friends at home, that sphagnum moss, that is, it's this stuff. Yeah. And this is the stuff, I'll come over to you as I walk through this peat bog. This is the stuff that, look, you can just wring it out with all the water. This is the stuff that we see in our floral arrangements to kind of on top of that soil to hold that moisture in. Incredible. So we've got peat. Doc, you mentioned something about these other kinds of vegetation down here and you call this what? This is called heather. So we've, got, so we've, we've met peat. We've met heather. Emily, I'm Nick. Good <laughs> to see everybody. Isn't this wild to learn about this progression? Really cool stuff. So we're on our way back to the car, walking with Emily off of this peat bog. And Emily, I walked by some of this heather that you introduced us to earlier. And it looks like someone has spit on this stuff. We're the only ones out here. Or cow slobber is on it. What in the world is this stuff all over this plant? Well, I think this stuff is very much like your spittle bog you guys will have at home. Um, so there's actually a little insect lives in that kind of spittle, what you think is spittle. So it's like a protective coating, really that they're living in, and you find that across all the heather around here. That's incredible. I mean, it's, it's seeing that stuff out here reminded us of home a little bit, so I thought that was good. You talked about cattle grazing on this peat bog and talking about cow slobber. How does that work into this protected area? Yeah, so peat bogs like this, um, one of our management techniques is actually using livestock, using cattle. Cattle are really good at getting on there, roughing the place up, bashing down some of the really grassy tussocks, which can get a bit overgrown, um, and we don't want loads of rank grass in our bog. They're also really good at bashing down any tree regeneration as well, and trees are not always the best thing for a bog. So we'll use really hardy varieties like Galloway cattle, Highland cattle as well. It's kind of conservation grazing, if you like. Wow, a balance between agriculture and here, preservation of this bog. Very interesting stuff. Well, as a light rain falls down here in southern Scotland, my friend and colleague, Dr. Dennis Duncan, and I came to Scotland to plan a study abroad. And Dr. Duncan's been running the camera today. has done a wonderful job. While we were here, we had a chance to meet up with Dr. Emily Taylor. We so appreciate you, Dr. Taylor, yeah. spending some time talking about nice. bogs. We met Pete and Heather. It was just a great time. Hey, y'all, we appreciate you watching all the way 4,000 miles away, bringing you some knowledge about agriculture. You know what to do. Go on to Facebook, check out the Georgia Farm Monitor page, and while you're there, you can check out the Ranger Nick page. And until next time, for the Farm Monitor, I'm Ranger Nick reminding you that enthusiasm's contagious, so pass it on. From Scotland, we'll see you back here again next month. See ya. All right, Nick, thank you, sir. Great job as always. Love that's that gonna, accent. Yeah, that's going to do it for this week's edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor.
And just a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm, be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and the Farm Monitor Show. Take care, everybody. We will see you next week right here on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Now we leave you today with a look at the recent farmer's market held just outside the state capitol in Grant Park in Atlanta. Have a great week, everybody.